The planet is heating up. The oceans are becoming filled with plastic. Change starts now. Change starts now. We're on a countdown to zero waste. Five, four, three, two, one. This is the Zero Waste Countdown Podcast. Here's your host, Laura Nash. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Zero Waste Countdown podcast and radio show. Today, I'm speaking with Rich Resgatis. Rich, did I say that right? You did. Thank you. So Rich is the co-founder and CEO of Flowwater, and I actually got to use one of these machines in Detroit last year at the Sustainable Brands Conference, which was pretty cool. So I just want to welcome you to the show. So thanks so much for joining me. Thanks, Laura. It's a pleasure to be on the show. And it's thrilled that you actually had a chance to use a flow water refill station last year. I didn't realize that. Uh, I want to start uh, with a little bit about you and like the problems that you're solving before we actually get into the machines and, and the company and stuff. So uh, one thing that really stood out to me, you're quoted as saying bottled water is the new cigarette. So can you tell us a little bit about that quote? Yeah, absolutely. I, I really do feel like uh, this is the environmental cigarette of this decade and and hopefully not decades to come because we've got a great opportunity to solve this problem very very quickly uh and if you look at big tobacco in the the 40s 50s 60s you know there's a lot of interesting parallels between big bottled water and big tobacco there's of course some significant distinctions as well but uh you know in the 60s 46 percent of americans smoked big tobacco knew of all of the horribly destructive health and also ultimately environmental effects of cigarettes. They had a ton of money. They had a ton of lobbying power, a ton of marketing engine power. And they really created a machine because it was really profitable. And if you look at big bottled water and what it does today and where it is today, there's a lot of amazingly similar attributes. So you look at the lobbying power, you look at kind of this greenwashing that's been done on recycling. So big bottled water promoting recycling is to me just kind of tragic greenwashing because it gives consumers a perception that, you know, so long as the bottle says it's recycled, all is good. And the reality is that even over the last 10 years of a lot of education around recycling, we're still seeing recycling rates that that are less than 25% of the population. If you look at You know, big bottled water, I mean, you know, huge number of consumers are drinking bottled water. It's terrible for the environment. It's actually terrible for your health. And if you look at actually the data, you know, average American, and and I'll just talk somewhat to global statistics, but then somewhat to U.S. American statistics because I'm pulling different data sets. But I I think they extrapolate worldwide the people that are in North America as well as, you know, across the pond in Europe. But uh, the average American is drinking two credit cards worth of plastic. Uh, a month, drinking or eating. And that's through the consumption of microplastics in our food and our water. And a lot of those microplastics, I mean, the average piece of plastic has over 10,000 different chemicals that are used to actually comprise that plastic. Cigarettes are 6,000. There's actually more chemical contaminants that are used to create the plastics that we're ingesting than there are in uh, tobacco and nicotine and cigarette products. There's 6,000 known chemicals in in nicotine products and chemical uh, uh, tobacco products. So there's a lot of interesting similarities to me. But what I think is also really interesting to me is that it's not public policy that's going to drive the change. It's not advocacy and causes. I mean, all of those are helpful influencers, but it's really consumer behavior and consumer mapping that is going to change it. And that starts by, you know, raising a level of consciousness and awareness of what the problem is. And then also looking at alternative and better ways to solve for that. And that's one of the reasons why, uh, t- you know, smoking today is right around 15, 16% uh, in the U.S. compared to 46% and in, in, in it's declining. Mm-hmm. So those are a few examples as to why I think there's some really interesting parallels to big tobacco and big bottled water. And our mission is to put an end to single use plastic water bottles, period. Uh, and and the, I think the future of water is distributed, decentralized water, wherever consumers work, rest, and play. You know, I think citizens worldwide have a right to be able to access clean drinking water. And in the process, we want to advocate for uncycling, which is, of course, not creating packaging waste where it's not needed. 
Mm -hmm. And I, I saw that you say that recycling is dead. So uh, why do you say that? Is that because the, the recovery rates are so low of plastic? They are. They're so incredibly low. And I, I think we should all recycle. I mean, this, this, this is one of those things where for products that need to be packaged or are going to continue to be packaged in um, plastic or, you know, certainly glass you know, is a favorable alternative in most cases, not in all cases. But ultimately, you know, my premise behind recycling is that is, uh, number one, wherever we can not use packaging to get the consumption of our food or our beverages is by far a superior thing. And it's, and it's superior not only for the environment, but also for our health. I mean, you just do not want to be drinking water that's been baking and sitting in plastic that is getting leaching of endocrine disrupting chemicals and on and on whenever you have mm -hmm. the choice. And so I think recycling is, is dead primarily because it doesn't change. Consumer behavior is incredibly difficult to change, right? Yeah. And it's one of these things where if you look at the recycling rates, even in places like San Francisco, so I'm in the Bay today, and if you ask 100 consumers if they recycle, 99 out of 100 will say, yes, they do. The reality is that uh, roughly less than 30% of even in the best and the most progressive areas of the Bay, the reality is less than 30% or less than 33% actually do behaviorally consistently recycle, number one. And then number two, what actually makes it through the full process of recycling and reclamation and going into kind of the ecosystem where it actually truly gets recycled is a subfraction of that. And so it's kind of a lost cause in many ways, which is, yes, we should still do it, but the recapture rates of recycled products are incredibly low and it's a losing proposition. It's really a proposition for uh, companies that are advocating around single use plastics to greenwash and to change the narrative and to try to make the narrative about something other than what it should be. And the narrative really should be about how do we create a platform where consumers don't need to use single use plastics altogether. And that's not a narrative that big bottled water companies like because it cuts at the very core of their business model. But it is it is the truthful and it is the the right narrative. Uh, and it's one that we're really vocalized on espousing and 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 there's other people that are doing it as well. And we cheer them on, and even if they're kind of competition or even if they're kind of frenemies, friend enemies, so to speak. I've got friends that are in the category that are competitors and uh, com competitors to our to us. And I, I describe them as frenemies because I want them to win because I want the category to win and we want the cause to win around uncycling and removing the need for single use packaging wherever possible. That's fantastic to hear. I feel the same way about zero waste communication. I want as much collaboration as possible. And, you know, a little competition is good sometimes, but really we all have the same goal. And that is to to bring these ideas that you don't need plastic water bottles every day, right? There are other solutions and alternatives and you don't need like to go coffee cups every day and and all these different uh, different topics. So um, that's really great to hear. Did you ever see that movie? Thank you for smoking. You know, I have not. I've not seen that movie. Uh, in fact, you're the third person. I'm just going to make a note of this because you are now the third person in three weeks that's asked me that, which is now to me a sign that I need to watch that movie this weekend. Those are some good endorsements then. Yeah, because it, it, it totally reminds me of that. It's all about the cigarette industry and how they knew and how they just kept pushing anyway. And it's it's very good. And uh, if you're listening and you want an interesting movie to watch, uh, it really does remind me of the bottled water industry and uh, and plastics and stuff like that. And, you know, the one thing we didn't really touch on is like the water rights issue, too, because I know that that happens in a lot of areas where some bottled water companies will come in and just like drain aquifers for like next to nothing and they don't really like pay the community very much for it and then you know i think that maybe sometimes they take a little too much uh so that's an issue as well and then uh there's also i saw this statistic on your site that unesco estimates that plastic pollution kills a hundred thousand marine mammals annually that's insane that's really horrible it is horrible and it's not a linear increase at this point we are approaching logarithmic increases unless we stop the problem and and you know so I'll use a parallel example, which is glyphosate and Roundup. You know, it wasn't prior to the early 1970s, it was never used, you mm -hmm. know, and, and it started being used in the early 70s. And it was not even 
picking up in our food and water sources in the mid 70s and late 70s until you know in the 80s and 90s is really when it started to be picked up and now now there's there's a lot of proliferation of roundup into our and trace quantities but i mean you don't want any of that stuff coming up uh you know in your food and water system uh on a chronic and kind of consistent and and perpetual basis and it's because we're now seeing the implication of many, many, many millions of gallons of Roundup usage worldwide, billions probably at this point in terms of gallons of usage. And, and we're seeing the proliferation of that that has concentrated and it's now starting to kind of apply and get into the water streams and the waterways logarithmically as opposed to linearly. And the same with microplastics, which is microplastics don't biodegrade, they photograde. One piece turns into two, four, eight, 16. And that exponentiality of the degradation of it is now starting to multiply to the point where there's going to be more microplastics than there are um, and, and plastic particles than there are fish by the year 2050. And that's mm -hmm. why we really need to take action today to put a stop to it, because we're now starting to experience the effects of kind of logarithmic microparticulate contamination. Um, and it's and it's not only affecting the environment, it's also in fact, it's affecting our health. Let's talk about your company and your machines. So you've basically kind of you've created the solution to replace all of these water bottles. And where I used it in Detroit, it was a conference. It was in a conference center. I probably filled up many times from there. I trusted that the water was safe to drink. It was a very pretty machine. Uh, it's not like those ones that are like gray that you kind of just typically see with a little counter on it, which are cool too. I like the counters. Um, but your machines have counters on them as well, I think, right? They do. I think that's very cool. Like that's very, very encouraging for people. I bet people remember to bring their bottles more just because of those counters. Because sometimes you'll see like, you know, 30,000 bottles saved or something, which is is really great. So tell us about the machine itself. Sure. Uh so seven years ago, you know, we started we started with this mission of putting in the single use plastic water bottles. And ultimately, the vision of the company is even quite a bit bigger than that, which is, you know, we really want to radically change the way that water is consumed worldwide. The fundamental premise of our company is that everyone has access an inherent right to access to clean drinking water that they can trust. And actually kind of alluded to some of the things about, you know, water rights and big bottle water actually coming in and, and grabbing water rights from local municipalities. And that's a super interesting subject. We'll cover that later. But kind of as it relates to your question specifically about the machines, the company is founded on this premise of what we are building are a platform of products. And I'll get to the machine in a second. But the company is founded on this premise of, you know, my vision is that we build a platform of products where you can end up putting a flow water device, a flow water piece of hardware, wherever there is a water faucet or a water spigot and radically change that water from whatever is incoming to the world's best tasting, best drinking water, wherever consumers work, rest and play. And right now what we're doing that with is a flow water refill station. And so that refill station is uh, an approximately six foot tall device, and it comes in a variety of colors. And someday that will come in a variety of form factors. And so someday that flow water system that you saw, and you can see on our website, drinkflowwater.com, someday what you will see is that flow water device will have a variety of different form factors. It'll have a form factor where there will be a smaller version of that that goes in businesses. There will be a countertop version of that. There will be a faucet version of that. And, and the idea of the company and the product is to radically change that water that's coming in and make it cleaner, taste better, and your preferred drinking water so that you don't reach for something that in, is in a piece of packaging. So talking a little bit more about the product, um, and, and you know, I'll kind of turn back to you just for additional follow-up questions and let you drive this where you want to drive it. But there's a couple of distinctions that I'd like to make about the product. The reason that this product exists is because not only bottled, bottled water is bad, but consumers don't like tap water. So, you know, the, one of the questions that I often get is, hey, Raz, if, if, if packaged water is so bad, why don't people just stop drinking it and drink out of the faucet? And that is a really great question. And it also sounds really logical, which is like, well, let's just stop that one thing and go to right to the faucet. And we don't have a problem for the most part worldwide particularly in more developed countries where we have a faucet shortage. Like that's not the issue. 
The issue is that the majority of consumers don't like or don't trust what's coming out of that faucet. That's why we have a $100 billion worldwide packaged water problem. And there's a variety of reasons why consumers don't like or don't trust what's in the tap. So our, our premise is, well, let's take whatever is coming out of the tap and make it better. In some cases, you know, what's coming out of the tap is pretty good. In other cases, it's not so good. And, you know, I, I do spend time talking about some of the problems with tap water. I have to say it is one of those. You know, mis- municipal water treatment does an amazing job considering what we have done to our waterways over the last 20, 30, 40 years. Have there been incidents of glyphosate being found in municipal drinking water? There have. I mean, there's data that's out there that shows that there's actually increased incidence of cancer that is tied to if you map tributaries and where water sources come from, that there's a greater concentration of increased cancers, uh, a variety of origins and and modalities that are tied to tributaries that come from uh, agricultural, higher concentrations of agriculture and uh, glyphosate usage in farming. And so there are also other pieces of data and uh, resources that are out there that show the increased cause of, for example, Crohn's disease or celiac disease or kidney cancer. And if you look at the increased incidence of cancers, celiac disease over the last 20, 30 years, there's almost a direct overlay and a correlation to increased usage of glyphosate commercially for agricultural purposes. And so there's some people that very strongly believe that there is a direct cause between some of these um, kind of major disturbances in our biorhythms environmentally, as well as uh, from a human kind of physiology perspective and increase uh, kind of dependency on chemical products to drive agricultural outcomes. But So is your machine able to filter that kind of stuff out? Yes, flow water machines wow. remove. So this is where, you know, going back a little bit more to the product, what the flow water magic does is it takes whatever water is coming out of your faucet or your water connection line. And right now, this is largely focused around businesses, schools, corporations, gyms, retailers, you know, any any type of commercial setting, but we're moving quickly into the home as well. What a flow water system does is it removes um, bacteria, viruses, chemical contaminants, inorganic solids down to 0.001 microns. And uh, just to give you an idea, you know, a lot of my, a lot of viruses, for example, are just 0.01 microns. So it's anywhere from 100 to 1,000 times more specific in removing micron size than the majority of bacteria and viruses. That's a, a lab grade rating, I think. It is. It's a lab grade yeah. rating. It's, it's, it's really a pharmaceutical grade and a commercial no grade of purification. And so... Yeah. What the flow water system basically does is one of three things. And, and, and there's seven in the refill station, there's seven distinct kind of filtering mechanisms. But I typically summarize it as a doing one of three things. One is the flow water system removes up to 99.999% of contaminants. So it's basically taking whatever's in that tap water that's coming through, and it is just completely extracting pharmaceuticals, herbicides, chlorine, viruses, bacteria, heavy metals herbicides like glyphosate, and it's pretty much leaving the consumer with pure H2O. It's almost completely pure H2O, pretty close to a distilled state. But you don't want to drink distilled water because the problem with drinking distilled water is you need to have certain things in that water, A, for it to taste good uh, and and for you to actually enjoy drinking. If you've ever drank uh, distilled water, it kind of doesn't taste right, and that's because it's missing minerals and certain salts. And, and then B, you need it to have certain minerals in order for prop to, uh, proper and optimal absorption. And so the second stage of what a flow water system does is flow water is reintroducing the essential minerals and elect- electrolytes, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium, into that water. There is also a set of alkaline filters that uh, drop uh, also 12 trace minerals into the water and and that increases alkalinity by up to 1.5 on the pH scale versus whatever's coming into the tap water. And what that does is it makes the water taste good, but it also makes it optimally absorbable and terrific for hydration. And then the third stage is a coconut carbon filter. So we use a certain type of coconut carbon 
and that is the final kind of finishing filter. And what that does is it makes the water taste amazing. It doesn't make it taste like coconut, but this coconut filter, and it's actually not from the inside kind of oily flesh of the coconut, but it's actually the husk of a coconut gets carbonated, it turns into carbon, and then it's actually put into a filter. And we use these certain coconuts that are grown in Southeast Asia that are from rich volcanic soil and turned into a coconut carbon that ends up leaving this water tasting amazing. And that's why many consumers will say it's the best tasting water they've, they've ever had. And it's part of the effect of that is from the coconut carbon finishing filter. And that's effectively what a flow water refill station does is it is a super purification device, but it also makes water taste great. So you know, we gave away around $60,000 worth of flow water units to Flint, Michigan around three years ago. Uh, It's the exact same flow water unit that we we have 5,000 flow water units throughout the United States, the exact same flow water units that we gave to the city of of Detroit, excuse me, Flint, Michigan in uh, 2016 is what was being used commercially elsewhere. And we were taking water that was coming out of the tap at up to 34 times the EPA limit for lead we're taking it, running it through a flow water system down to undetectable levels of lead. I mean, you couldn't even, there was no trace, there was not even a trace detection of lead. And that's just what a powerful purification system will do is it will extract all the bad stuff and leave you with only the good stuff, which is how we are going to transform the way consumers drink water. That's sad to hear about that still happening in Flint. And you know, you might not want to drink tap water. But again, like a lot of places around the world don't even have tap water that you can drink at all. Uh, So I do feel privileged that a lot of our municipalities have tap water. uh, But so you don't sell machines yet for people's houses, right? Is that something you're like working on in the future? It's kind of it's kind of a yes. And then it's a definitive yes. So we do have a flow water refill station that we have introduced to the consumer marketplace. But, you know, I want to be clear, it is a really high grade piece of equipment. It is a very expensive piece of equipment. And so if you go to drinkflowwater.com, you can find flow water refill stations that are the same quality and the same grade of refill stations that we sell to corporations, gyms, retailers, educational facilities. And some consumers are actually buying those for their home. And uh, there are financing options where they can, for a couple hundred dollars a month, end up having a flow water refill station for their home. That is also a very expensive, high-grade product. And it's really about the best that you could possibly get for water consumption. But it's also, you know, just recognizing reality. It's not a solution for every consumer. Uh, It's a very high-end system. And so what we are Mm -hmm. quickly working on right now, and we will launch by the end of this year and probably by Q3, a flow water for the faucet. And you'll have access for flow water for the tap where it's going to be not as sophisticated of a system, but it is going to be a terrific filtering system so that you can take the water that's being freely distributed to wherever you work, rest, and play. And you're going to be able to have an opportunity for a you know a much more kind of value conscious uh, crowd to be able to improve your tap water. The other problem though is that, but even if a consumer says, "Well, I'm going to drink bottled water because of those problems," <laughs> the problem with that is that half of bottled water is tap water anyway. So yeah, you're, now all you're doing is you're drinking tap water from a bottle that's been sitting in plastic for six, nine, 12 months that's degrading the environment, it's creating microplastics and you're drinking the microplastics, right? And so it's kind of a double whammy and that's the problem that we need to solve for is what we need to do, we need to take the tap water that is freely available to us and make it better and better to varying degrees. You know, and there's gonna be certain systems that make it really, really better just because it has more horsepower and it has more potency. But our focus is on taking the water that's available to consumers wherever they are. And ultimately, that does turn into, you know, worldwide endeavor, including to locations where they don't even have access to safe drinking water and and to radically change the water that people do have access to by filtering it or purifying it directly at the source. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. Uh, We don't have much time, but I wanted to ask you about the repairability of the machines and like the maintenance. So I'm assuming they're not going to just work for a couple months and then you have to like landfill them. Like, are they repairable? Are they like durable? Do they last for years and years? They do. The the refill stations are designed to last 10 to 15 years. And so uh, that's that's a really long time. 
It is. So, I mean, we, ha we have a couple of really great data points for that. I mean, one is the fact that uh, our business has been around for seven years. We've been in the commercial marketplace for six years and all the refill stations that were put into the market six years ago, five years ago, four years ago are still still working and functioning. Uh, the second thing is that the system was designed to be built and, and, and replaced modularly. So there are panels, you know, if you look at the system, it's really been built, built on a modular platform. So certain panels could be replaced or internals could be replaced or upgraded or filters changed uh, as needed. Filter changes are typically done once a year or every 12,000 gallons. Uh, and the third thing is that we are working with a manufacturer that's been doing nothing other than water purification for almost three decades. And so they have a tremendous amount of manufacturing expertise around building a uh, product that lasts in the market for 10, 15, 20 years. And so our, our build life is 10 plus years. And what we'll do is a mild refurbish at year five or seven to just refresh some of the internals in the unit. And you're good for another five, seven years. Awesome. Uh, why are you interested in sustainability? Like so many people just aren't. Why do you care so much? And why have you built this this uh, refill station that is doing such wonderful things for not only the environment, but the health of people? There's really a few reasons why I'm, I'm in this. One is I've got two daughters that are 16 and 18. And when uh, we started this endeavor, they were you know much younger. It was seven years ago. So they were nine and 11. And I remember going to some of their soccer games and, you know, and as a parent, you're taking your kids to soccer games and then, you know, somebody has got the Saturday schedule where they're bringing snacks. And it didn't really hit me until I started going to these soccer games and I saw the programming. It's like one thing when you do something for your kids yourselves and you're stopping by and you're going to McDonald's, you're buying them soda or what have you, which I didn't do very much of, but you probably don't recognize as much what you're doing as you do the observation of other people. And so I would go to these Saturday games or the Saturday practices and I would see people bringing like the snacks were like Dr. Pepper and Coke and Sprite and Mountain Dew. And the snacks were like junk food. I mean, it was just like absolute junk and chips and packaged, you know, candies and candy bars and I kind of became outraged with it. I was like, man, we're actually literally programming our kids from such an early age of a set of dependencies. And I, I really look at, I really truly look at canned, carbonated, sugarized beverage products loaded with caffeine as a form of kind of liquid heroin for our kids. And it, it's legalized liquid heroin for them because it has such addictive uh, propensity and tendencies that it creates lifelong addictive behaviors that are creating an obesity epidemic. I mean, no, no one starts at the age of 25 saying, "Hey, I want to just get, I want to get loaded up on sugar and caffeine and become really overweight and develop type two diabetes." That stuff happens out of a series of behaviors that program programmatically happen at young ages, and so that's part of what like launched this for me, which is, well, how do we change the way people look at hydration and water in doing something good for the environment, but also something that's good for them that can, mm -hmm. like small changes can have a major impact. And water is one of those things where, if, you know, you look at 70% of our body is made up of water. And so if we look at making a major impact into health and wellness and vitality and vibrance and something that is good for humans, but also good for the environment, getting rid of plastics, getting rid of packaging and drinking more water is uh, something that I just got really excited about. You know, it's not the only mission that matters in life, of course. I mean, I, I have other personal passions and pursuits, but I think I'm clearly very passionate about what it is that the Flowwater team is building and developing and doing. And all those people that are part of this mission, whether they're Flowwater users or not, there's a lot of people that are part of this mission. And yeah. uh, it's one that I'm really excited about and, and, and feel very, very strongly about because it can have a huge ROI for our health and our environment. Awesome. Well, I wish we had time to talk more because this is just great. And by the way, those cans, a lot of them have the BPA liners in them too. So again, not good for kids, right? To be giving them cans of pop. Um, but I just wanted to thank you so much, Rich, for everything that you do. This sounds like an amazing company and uh, you're bringing health and wellness to not only people, but the planet. Uh, so that's really wonderful. So thank you.
Thank you. Well, it was a pleasure to be on the show. Thank you for the work that you're doing as well and just advocating and bringing in a level of awareness. I mean, I think all of this ends up starting with awareness and having a consciousness to it, which is for me, it didn't exist 20, 30, 40 years ago. But uh, over the last decade, I had kind of a major awakening to this. And so we're all on this journey together. I'm thrilled to uh, have been a part of your program and your show. And thanks for the great work that you're doing as well. Oh, thanks so much. That's really awesome to hear. Well, that was Rich Resgatis. He is the co-founder and CEO of Flow Water. Change starts now. This is the Zero Waste Countdown Podcast.